This is Into the Singleverse with Raj Verma. Unfiltered conversations about the latest trends and the tangible effects of real-time data on pivotal industries, our daily lives, and the future of our world. My guests this week are Lonnie Jaffe and Teddy Roddy, Managing Directors at Inside Partners. Lonnie began his tech journey at the ripe old age of four with the Commodore VIC-20. He honed his programming skills at Stuyvesant High School uh, and Harvard while interning at Microsoft. Lonnie joined Inside Partners in 2017 and focuses on AI, machine learning, healthcare software, fintech, and other innovative technologies. Teddy is a veteran venture investor focused on high growth software and internet companies. Teddy also joined Insight Partners in 2017, where he works closely with portfolio companies and leads new investments. Before becoming an investor, Teddy co-founded and served as CTO of Novo Grid, a cloud services marketplace acquired by Also Group. Lonnie, Teddy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you. All right. So, look, uh, we, we'll just have a casual conversation here uh, and uh, just talk about a few things that we've both spoken in the past and um, a, a few things that our listeners have requested for uh, in this podcast. So, uh, uh, it'll be great, Alani and Teddy, uh, whoever goes first, to just introduce yourself a little bit about your journey in tech. What got you started? Lani, of course, we know you got started at four with the interest in programming and how it led you to tech. And uh, yeah, and, and then we uh, go on a wandering journey from that. I actually had a fairly similar journey. I, I started with a Commodore six, C64, so slightly different platform, but uh, I think quite a quite a similar trajectory as Lani. I think it was five or six years old at, at that and like to tinker with, with software. Um, and you know, building building software. I think it was coding basic when I was like eight years old, and went from there. Uh, ended up um, founding a startup when I was still undergrad. Uh, spending seven long years on the journey, learning a lot about the ins and outs of building a business, but also about the kind of software and hardware stack and things like how the internet really works and so forth. It was like the pre cloud era when you actually had to have servers, uh, physical Sun servers in in Iraq. So it was a it was a more physical approach to building companies than it might be today when you just harness uh, the cloud. And then uh, after uh, exiting that, I moved to the venture investing dark side and have been investing in application software and infrastructure and cybersecurity for the past decade. I used to be CEO of an Insight portfolio company. So that company was called SyncSort at the time. It's now called Precisely. It's an older company. It was founded in 1968. So uh, before I was born, uh, I didn't. I did not start it. And I spent about 15 years at IBM and CA Technologies before that, uh, both also fairly old companies that were founded before I was born. That's great. Uh, so, you know, uh, you and I have now uh, Insight invested in Single Store in 2020. I remember uh, October, November timeframe, and um, it was an interesting journey to get to that place and has been a very rewarding journey uh, since. So if I haven't done that before, which I know I have, but thank you all for your support uh, and your investment. It uh, literally uh, saved the company and uh, we wouldn't have been here without you guys' support. It's been really, truly wonderful uh, to work with both of you. Now, uh, I've been an operator all my life and uh, I, uh, I don't really know what it is to be an uh, investor. You both have been operators and uh, now investors. So what do you think are the top two or three differences between your life as an operator versus your life as an investor? Uh, maybe, Lani, you go first this time and then uh, Teddy. There's a lot that people will talk about about the differences. One um, somewhat um, maybe contrarian perspective on this is there are elements about it that are maybe not as different as people will sometimes think. Um, so, you know, as an investor, you're usually working with more companies, more legal entities, at least, right? Uh, so, you know, there's separate C corps or LLCs, and you don't necessarily invest and end up owning all of each of them, right? Like you can invest in a company like Single Store and own a certain percentage of that, and you can get a control position. We do uh, at Insight. Partners, we do venture buyouts where we can take control of a company. So you can end up 
with governance control, but maybe still not 100. percent You know, you have extremely high caliber CEOs like you who um, are leading the companies, and you know, it's not exactly an employer employee relationship. It's a little different, but there are some similarities there. And you share management responsibility to some degree with the other investors and board members who are involved, which is not a thing that usually happens in companies. They're usually the org chart, you know, everybody only works for one person or they may have set sort of dotted line relationships. But when you actually, you know, look at the day to day, there can actually be a lot of similarities, right? You're helping the companies become more successful. You know, if you add up the revenue of all of the portfolio companies in a place like Insight, um, you know, it's a like a large software company, yeah, like a really large one, you know, not totally dissimilar to what you would see at like the IBM software business or something like that. Um, and there's some advantage, uh, significant advantages of the investor form factor, right? Like uh, people who work in a company can get equity in the thing that they're working on, right? The actual uh, smaller unit. Whereas in a larger company, you, know, you, you have to end up designing uh, kind of more operating metric type incentive structures to give people economics in their day to day, because often the parent company is just so big that it's hard for any single person other than the CEO and some of the single ex- the senior execs to really be able to affect the outcome of it. Um, and it can also be a little bit more elegant uh, configuration wise, like you can invest in something, you can make it worth a lot more, and it's a little easier to exit it, right? You can keep it for a long time. And you know, we have really long term time horizons with our investments. But you don't have to keep it forever the way, you know, a large multinational corporation will often keep things and only divest of them or spin them out if they're not doing well, you know, the, you know, non-core, but often that means it's kind of a euphemism for not doing well. That can be a positive. But, you know, of course, there are differences. Like the pacing is very different. You know, I, I spent some time doing M&A at a couple of different, you know, larger companies. And, you know, we're able to do uh, really high caliber diligence with just a lot more urgency, right? So it, it, we're able to get deals done much more quickly. And we don't have quite as much infrastructure at the fund level as you might get at a large multinational publicly traded C Corp, let's say. But we do try to replicate a lot of it. So we have a team called Insight Onsite, which at this point is over 120 full-time people. And they're designed to you know, be functional. So you have sales, marketing, product management, technology, architecture. Right Within sales, you have people who work on sales rep territory design and recruiting and uh, comp planning and you know, the Marketing Center of Excellence, you have people who do category creation workshops or who can uh, work on building out account-based marketing systems or manage relationships with partner and Forrester. So we do tr- try to recreate a little bit of what you would get from being a business unit within the context of a large multinational corporation you know, because of our scale. There, there's a lot of advantages to scale, like the ability to amortize those kinds of fixed costs over a larger portfolio. Yeah, I would say that the key difference, it's like being an operator, being an investor is... It's really about like a single bet versus a portfolio, and and uh, kind of how it manifests itself. I would say is that when I was an operator, I would spend all my time with my team, like management team employees and my customers. And sometimes you know you spend some time with your investors, and then sometimes you see your competition at a trade show or something like a couple of times a year. And you know it's a very like focused way of, way of doing things. And you're doing this one thing like twenty four seven, and then as an investor, you work with multiple companies you know, 5, 10, 15, whatever is standard in the investor world. So you're going to have this portfolio where you're context switching constantly. And then the result really is that um, when you're an operator, the, the highs are very high, but then also the lows are very low. I remember when I was operator, like when we won a big contract, like it was like one of the best best moments. Like, Raj, I'm sure you're going to relate to this, like winning a big deal, making a quarter, like that's that's really great. But then the, the lows are also very low. Like something bad happens to the business. Like you like churn a deal or you like, like he, you know, a kind of attrition in the in the management team that you don't like. Like these things are kind of feel pretty dramatic when it happens. And then as an investor, like somebody making their quarter or not making the quarter, it's just kind of you know the lows are not as low, but the highs are not as high, and it's just kind of a different approach to it. And I I think that's the reason why sometimes some operators are just like gravity operating that they might try investing and they find it kind of less exciting or it doesn't like doesn't really provide the adrenaline rush that they like in operating and that's why sometimes the personality types are a little bit different so i think that's like really the, the key difference is like a single bet versus portfolio and kind of how vested you are in the success of that like one company versus versus many you know well said uh, the thing that i find really amusing really 
is uh, when you get on the internet, you say, check out the deck that helped uh, Raj raise $100 million or Peter raise $50 million. And they they have this, they almost make it sound like there is a secret sauce in the deck that gets investors to invest in, in people, which, you know, I know is not true. Of course, you know, it's not true. So let's uh, let's talk to our audience about you know you you see a number of companies coming your way at various stages for investment. What are s- probably the top two or three mistakes that uh, CEOs or management teams make when they come to come to investors like yourself? Uh, how about Teddy? Uh, you go first on this one. I think the key one is that the the if we like look at the pitch really is it that. The pitch has to be tied to the stage of the business and like what you're trying to raise. Like often like people say that Series A's are raised really on a vision or some like well seed are raised on a vision and team. Series A's are raised on some like some proof of traction of most of the vision. And then Series B and growth rounds are raised on proof and metrics and so forth. So I think sometimes founders go go a bit wrong in the fact that they the way they pitch their company and kind of what what they highlight and what they try to prove isn't really a match. So you might be trying to raise a Series C, but you're actually talking only about some like future vision, like five years from now. Whereas the growth stage investors only want to see that page eighteen with those metrics and you know KPIs and retention and growth. And that way around, like you might be raising a seed round and you're showcasing just the fact that okay, like you actually have revenue, you closed like a hundred k contract. Whereas people are investing, like is this going to be your next IPO? They actually want to hear the story. So. That, that, that would be one thing that there's a little mismatch in kind of what you highlight for the stage of investment that you're trying to raise. One of the nice things about growth stage investing is in a way, like the world does some of the work for you of, of understanding the business. Like you've sort of offloaded the task of figuring out if things are working to the world. There's the growth rate and the revenue and things like that, but the revenue itself has a lot of I'll call them quality ingredients, right? So things like high gross margins, high recurring revenue with high customer retention rates, rap- rapid expansion within customers, things like that. And you know, you can see improving unit economics, decreasing CACs over time. And these are all, you know, not guarantees, but they're strong signals of, you know, the sustainability of the business and customers' love of the product and the potential for future cash flows. If you have, you know, other things about the business that will make it durable and what I mean by durable, I mean is like it can keep growing in an efficient way for a really long period of time, right? Like if a company grows at 50% a year for uh, you know, 10 years, it's 50 times larger, 50% a year for 20 years, and it's what, like 3,000 times larger. So it makes a very big difference to have a business that's very durable. And, th- and that happens, right? You see companies like Google and others that have been able to grow at those kinds of paces for that length of time. I'd say like a, a common mistake is when a founder just or a CEO tries to obfuscate all of that information, right? Like, you, know, you you'll see things like you know putting the details of how the business is doing traction wise towards the very very end, um, or to just like you know cherry pick certain metrics to show as and kind of leave out others. And like, no business is perfect, right? Everybody will agree on what the platonic ideal of a uh, really high quality business might look like, and you know what you're disagreeing about is which things that are not perfect you're willing to. Uh, accept as risks or challenges. And you just need to see all of that upfront, right? Obviously, having those things be better is better. Um, and then being being really effective at articulating them. And then I'd say there's another thing, which is just being able to tell the story about the business in a way that's compelling and evocative, right? Like, what about this is the reason why it's going to be sustainably differentiated? Like, what kinds of things improve with scale? There's a lot of aspects of businesses that get better as the business grows. You know, things like net- network effects or you know, data businesses will often be able to aggregate more data, and that's a benefit. There's huge supply side economies of scale that get better as more people use the product, things like that. And just being able to tell the story around why the product itself will continue to be compelling over time and maintain a competitive advantage. How much or what quality, which is not quantifiable, do you? look for in a founder or a CEO that is sitting metaphorically across the table from you, uh, both uh, that that will basically be a, well, we aren't investing in because of this, or we will invest in it because of this. I mean, the, the qualitative stuff is is quite quite hard, but I it's, it's also it's, it's very important. I think that's why investing throughout the pandemic was quite difficult, as you had to make investment decisions purely 
based on Zoom meetings instead of meeting people in person. And at least I believe that meeting people in person and spending more time than a one hour Zoom, like it, or, or time, it, you, you just kind of learn much more about people. At least what I look for in CEOs is, is really like, is this, is this a person who can kind of work through various situations that, that arise over an investment journey. Like when you invest in kind of early growth stage in these companies, it's often a, you know, in successful scenarios, it's, it could be like a seven or eight year journey together. And the companies, you know, grow to like 10, 20, 50 X the size, uh, both in terms of revenues and headcounts and so forth. So it's really about like figuring out if the person is someone who can kind of stay with the journey for a long time and kind of adapt uh, him or herself to dealing with all these situations that we see arising in software businesses over, over kind of time. So it's, it's, it's quite non-scientific in, in a way, but you're really kind of like testing, like, is this a relationship that you see as a, as a long-term workable thing? And you see as a person who you can kind of work through some tougher situations, not just the good board reports and kind of fantastic outcomes. There are some things that the CEO is the is a manager. And so there's just good leadership and management things that you will often want to see, right? The ability to make good decisions quickly, to hold the organization to high standards. Um, one thing that people are sometimes concerned about with less experienced CEOs, you know, sometimes technical founders who haven't run a sizable company before, are they going to be able to hold people to be accountable for performing well? Or are they going to be a pushover? Um, but, you know, they also want people like really good people want their CEO to be kind and fair too. They don't want them to be mean or aggressive. And um, it's critical to be able to recruit and motivate teams. So it's probably one of the most important skill sets and you know, being the kind of person that people want to work for. And then I would just say there's like a lot of things that can go wrong day to day in a company and sort of having the temperament to sort of get energized by those kinds of challenges as opposed to frustrated by them, right? Because you're constantly needing to work through unglamorous tasks that um, get in your way and, you know, and figure out creative solutions to problems and things like that. And, and, you know, some people really enjoy that and some people find it really not pleasant. Yeah, no, in fact, uh, a lot of times people ask me, what was my experience becoming a CEO? Because as you know, I was COO for a long time. And I often wondered, you know, how much different could, you know, number one be compared to number two? And I, I articulated and I said, I became funnier overnight and lonelier overnight. <laughs> and did you become a CEO? It is a very lonely job. Like that's what people can underappreciate. Yeah. They, and actually that was the biggest surprise. And intellectually you get it. You get it. Yeah, it's going to be lonely, this, that, and the other. One of the things about being an investor, that's you get to work with a lot of CEOs. Whereas like as a CEO, you don't. I mean, you, you can like personally try to network with them, but it isn't as much as part of the day to day. You actually learn a lot about CEO-ness, you know, in the investor role where you're dealing with really high caliber CEOs day in and day out. Yeah. In fact, one of the most cathartic things that uh, I tend to do is uh, I've got a foursome at my golf club and the other three are CEOs as well. And it's just, it's just cathartic just to speak to them about some of the issues that we have. And uh, and just make fun of each other's companies and you know whatever is happening, but you're right. It's a, it's a very very lonely job, and I I never you know that was I guess the the biggest surprise for me. 2021, the madness in the investment world. In fact, I met one of my old. Uh, in fact, I sold one of my companies to to him, and he has now moved to the uh, you know the VC side of the firm. And uh, he he looked uh, you know pretty suicidal, uh, and he's like, I have invested sixty percent of my portfolio in twenty twenty one, right? So uh, it's uh, it's it's been uh, it's it's not been a good year because uh, of whatever you know the multiples having dropped, etc. So how would you how would you articulate what uh, you know we on the other side of the fence or or the public at, at large? calls it the 2021 madness uh, where companies with you know were getting just unreal multiples etc Lani how do you how do you if there is a word like rationalize it or how, how do you think about it when we invest we're, we're typically underwriting a business case that involves multiples coming down over time in pretty much any market environment 
And the reason for that is as the companies grow, their growth rate does tend to slow. Not always, but it usually tends to slow down. And as a result, the multiples tend to just compress. When, when multiples are higher, like higher than normal because of the sort of macro fluctuations in, in multiples, um, you, you want to underwrite to more significant multiple declines. And you know, this is may seem sort of obvious, but it's, it's useful to say some of these things out loud. Like if, if a multiple, a revenue multiple, let's say, for a high growth company comes down significantly, let's say it drops by 50%. But the company is growing at 100% a year, uh, which is not uncommon for high growth businesses. And the multiple doesn't continue to come down, right? You don't have to wait that long before the absolute value of the business is you know, well above where it was, and then it continues to grow at you know, 100% per year at that point. The real challenge, I think, coming out of 2021, um, that it is, and I think this is partially related to the pandemic, where in many cases, there was a pull forward of demand. Um, and there was just a uh, behavior on the part, I think, of large com- companies where it was like, we we are not really putting a lot of scrutiny on what we're spending on software because we just want to make sure that everyone who's working from home has everything that they can possibly need, right? Like you, you just built a new house and you're getting all the nicest things for it, right? And you're not really paying attention to all the, all the, the costs associated with it. And then as interest rates uh, went up significantly and people became a lot more cost conscious um, and started tightening their belts, it turns out a lot of that pull forward of demand uh, resulted in sort of slower budget uh, spending behaviors on the part of companies. And the big impact there is that it can slow the growth rate down. And so that, that sort of double whammy of growth rates coming down and multiples declining is a big part of what happened you know, from 21 to 22 to where we are today. And um, so I mean, that's a little hard to predict you know, with a lot of uh, precision going forward, but a big, I think, wild card going forward if you know, we're at the lower part of the multiple decline is what will happen to growth rates. Will they kind of pick up to where they were or get somewhere closer to that? Or, um, or will they uh, you know, stay relatively subdued? Because that, that will have a big uh, impact on the pace of valuation increases going forward. It's not as if in 2021, the venture and growth investing community just decided that we will invest the same kind of assets we were doing a few years before at like double and triple the multiples. It's it's more the fact that those assets that a lot of people saw in 2021, they looked like they were growing incredibly fast and they, they were kind of like very, very unique. And then of course, turned out a lot of that was kind of demand pull forward or something that was not sustainable, but a lot of very smart people kind of underwrote that growth just to continue year in, year out. And that's kind of how we we, we got the 2021 uh, situation. Um, it's also good to recognize that software sector, it's not totally uniform. There's different subcategories of software that are, have like different kind of shapes of demand curves and, you know, over over this period. Of course, the general trend is very clear that there was kind of this like big optic and then now it's like s- slowed down or gone back to, you know, historical kind of averages. but some sectors like cybersecurity is still very strong. We've seen like so strong demand throughout this period. Just to pick another one, like sales and marketing software, which was selling a lot to tech companies, has been much, much harder in this current environment where salespeople are being sales heads are being cut and, you know, budgets are under pressure. And then some other category software are kind of in the middle. So it's also kind of important to realize that it's not like there's one market called software. There's a lot of different product categories. There's a lot of recurrent customer segments. Selling to like venture back tech companies right now is not a tremendously attractive customer segment because they are under pressure for sharing profitability and so forth. But you know, selling to main street businesses and let's say healthcare or you know financial services in the U.S. like is pretty stable. That's right. Uh, some of the folks, uh, including myself, I think that the opportunity, the Gen AI opportunity that lies in front of us is. Uh, has the potential for being one of the largest opportunities that I've seen in my career. And, you know, I, I worked through the, you know, uh, the internet boom, so as to speak, and the cloud and the SaaS businesses, et cetera. What's your take on generative AI um, and its place in the future? And how do you lens it specifically from a investor perspective, Teddy? I agree with you. It's clearly going to transform so many industries and so many business processes. 
there's this like hype cycle that sometimes we as investors and, and, and founders, we, we tend to sometimes like overly hype some things in, in the beginning of a trend, and then you're going to find this plateau of productivity. I th- think we're kind of going through that now, but it's, it's clear that the, the promise is, 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 is very large. The way we look at it, and Lonnie can talk a lot more about this, is that um, the picks and shovels of, of this trend is, is very, very interesting. Like you, you, you look at all the kind of new, not just the foundational models, but like all the, all the workflow and the data stack and all these things. There's just like a same way with like mobile and cloud, there's always like a whole new trend of opportunities that's usually captured by new companies instead of incumbents that comes with this like change in computing platforms. And like, I think that same thing's happening in AI. Doesn't necessarily mean that like there's going to be, you know, 30 abstraction frameworks for LLMs or, 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 or something like that, but it's, it's clear that there's going to be a lot of new, very valuable companies built over the next five years in, in the kind of AI tool chain. And Lana, you've got a very interesting framework, which I, you know, every time I want to sound intelligent, I copy and of course call it mine. Uh, why don't you share your, your insights into what you think the future of Gen AI uh, is likely to be? We've been thinking about this a little bit as, right, so you had the, I'll call them the AI prediction system, AI recommendation systems, classification systems, the sort of post AlexNet, so after 2012, but you know before uh, the foundation models came on the scene. And you know those systems of prediction and classification are also improving at, in some cases, a fairly rapid pace. We've been seeing some really interesting things going on in healthcare with portfolio companies like Overdead and Internet of Health and others. Um, so I'll put those aside for now. So there are these new uh, systems that are, in, in a sense, still doing prediction, right? They're predicting the next token in a body of text, or they're predicting you know, how to modify an image in order to create something more uh, of what you asked for. But qualitatively, it's different. They're really more systems of creation. So they can do things like write code or generate images or videos or draft blog, blog posts. And what they're doing effectively, you know, sort of over, oversimplified a little bit, is they're driving down the costs and price of a huge number of additional tasks, you know, sort of like what we saw with electricity and cars, computers, and uh, and even the prior generation of AI, the internet, you know, mobile phones. It can um, it it can commoditize certain business models. It can make certain human tasks less valuable. It can also make things much more valuable. It can create new business models. It can unlock talent in new places. And uh, the stakes are very high, right? Like if you just imagine something like a 5% improvement in EBITDA in the S&P 500, and you put a 12x EBITDA multiple on it or something like that, you're talking about trillions of dollars in value. And it's just been very rapid, the pace at which it's starting to impact all sorts of industries that have historically been somewhat resistant to extreme impacts from software changes, right? Education and law and healthcare and media and content creation software development and things like that. Um, uh, and so the point that Teddy was hit- hinting at around the uh, the balance of power between startups and incumbents, it actually feels pretty different from a lot of shifts in that, you know, you look at what's been happening with some of the large players who have released foundation model capabilities already this calendar year. And we've seen it with our own portfolio as well, where we have, um, we have you know, dozens and dozens of companies that started working on their first hackathon or brainstorming session, uh, sing- single store included in this in a way, um, even though it's not at the application layer. And they've they've already released something to production this year, right? So it's like they they started working on something and it's already out and it's only been you know, not even a full calendar year. And often the advantage they have is multifaceted, right? So they have distribution, right? They can you know, Adobe or Microsoft can light up a capability in PowerPoint or uh, Photoshop to millions of users worldwide. Uh, they also have the ability to leverage data assets that they have access to, right? Adobe trained Firefly on their Getty Images competitor where they own the copyrights of the images and so they can indemnify the customers against copyright infringement, things like that. Uh, but they also have their products and people use these products, right? They have enormous market share. You know, when I was an intern at Microsoft working on PowerPoint, I think the market share, you know, within a couple of years got up to above 95% or something like that. And there's a lot of inertia around people wanting to move off of tools in order to use generative AI capabilities when those tools also have them, right? So if, you, if you're trying to disrupt those products 
and your only angle is that you're using generative AI. And those tools also release generative AI, but the gen AI knows how to use their products really well. Um, it's going to be really tough. What we've been paying a lot of attention to is, all right, so what are the kinds of moats that people are building up around this technology? Right? There's the obvious ones around having an existing application and distribution and data assets. Trust seems to be really important, and that also tilts towards large incumbents to some degree. You know, the, uh, people are very anxious about these technologies for many good reasons. Uh, brands that are able to earn trust around privacy and safety will have a pretty big advantage. This is hard to build, but easy to use trust. Um, building out efficient infrastructure for uh, what people call inference, so running the systems, uh, that seems to be a much more uh, sor a significant source of advantage than I would have expected and more durable too than I would have predicted in the sense of like, if you can have a more efficient infrastructure, if you can run your system at 90% lower cost uh, and you grow faster than everyone else, that advantage tends to increase over time. So you start to outpace the competitors. Uh, you know, having the right kind of talent, you know, being able to build beautiful products that people love. Um, there's some some emerging modes around usage demand side economies of scale. So as more people use the product, you get feedback data, which you can use to improve you know, everything from prompt engineering to fine tuning data, uh, reinforcement learning, feedback, things, things like that. And then investors with uh, the ability and permission to invest over long term time horizons, right, where you don't have to return EBITDA or GAP EPS to your investors within the same calendar year, right, where you have the ability to plant some EBITDA in the ground or EPS or profits in the ground to blossom into a profit flower or profit tree in a few years. So we've been, you know, thinking about, okay, that's all interesting. Does that just make this hard to invest in? And the answer is yes, but there's also some really interesting areas, you know, some threads to pull on. So one is, you know, a lot of these tools are uh, what Kevin Scott for Microsoft has been calling making hard things easier, right? But there's this class of thing, which is about making something that wasn't possible, possible. And those can represent interesting startup opportunities because by definition, there may not be an incumbent because it was impossible. And because it's still, it, it, it's possible now, but it may still be hard. So you can enjoy a technical mode for a couple of years and get to enough scale that you can uh, eventually transition to some more scale oriented mode like network effects or data effects. Our portfolio company, uh, Profluent, which has chat GPT-like technology to create protein, uh, do protein design is potentially a good example there. Um, infrastructure software, like uh, I'm on the board of a company called Run AI that, um, you know, sort of like VMware for graphics processing units, it lets you drop your uh, your GPU utilization for you know, a really large cluster. You know, if you're, if you're running on a, a big NVIDIA cluster, you can uh, run it much more efficiently. You can let teams work together in a way that's much more efficiently. You can drop your utilization by up to 80%. Um, those products, when highly differentiated and start to build up platform effects and get wired in from an ecosystem perspective, those can and start to build up talent network effects where people learn the product and take it with them from job to job. Those can be uh, really interesting uh, businesses that have massive uh, addressable markets. There's some interesting venture buyout opportunities, I think, as well, where you have, you know, a business that's perfectly good on its own, but there's some, you know, but they are the incumbent in their space, you know, sort of like many of our existing portfolio companies, and where they, with a little bit of help from, you know, we're building out a lot of infrastructure at the fund level around using this kind of technology internally for marketing and sales and software development, but then also, you know, how do you incorporate it into products, you know, on a detailed brass tacks kind of way, like how do you you know, leverage single stores, uh, vector database capability to do retrieval augmented generation in a way that's super efficient and things like that. And if if you if you can sort of invest in maybe even do a venture buyout of that kind of company and then upgrade them to this new product, sometimes the Gen AI product, when combined with the underlying product and install base and data asset, can be even bigger. It can be a feature but even bigger than the underlying product. And you see a little bit of this with like GitHub Copilot versus GitHub, right? Like you imagine the eventual state of GitHub Copilot where it's writing an enormous portion of your code, even though it's a feature on top of the IDE, the software development environment, in some ways it's a much bigger thing than the underlying product that it's built on. Um, and you can potentially charge multiples of the underlying product for it. There are a number of challenges here, right? So you know, things like hallucination and alignment and a lot of legal questions, a lot of issues around explainability and privacy and training and inference costs being very high and things like that. And these challenges represent startup opportunities, right? And so, you know, to the extent that people can solve them in a way that's differentiated, um, that's an interesting uh, additional investment angle. 
Um, and there's just a lot of, you know, massive amounts of unknowns. You know, I'd say like a really big one is just how quickly will we reach a state of diminishing returns and capability to these language models, right? Will it be really soon or will it take a really long time? You know, people will act like they know the answer to that, but they don't, right? There's a lot of those kinds of issues, you know, large models versus small open source models, which ones will win out in the long term? How should AI be regulated? You know, should you do fine tuning versus vector search and prompt enhancement? You know, will startups or incumbents capture more value in this area? You know, will it increase profitability and growth or will it drive down prices, things like that. There's a lot you can do from an investment perspective by just uh, watching the way those things are playing out and keeping an open mind about them as opposed to um, you know, being stubborn and jumping to conclusions before we know all the answers. But if I think about like this, a lot of the new application startups we see like that, like AI driven, I think what a lot of founders underestimate is how sticky workflow is in, in B2B scenarios and kind of integration workflow. Like just because your thing is easier to use and faster because of AI, like doesn't mean that it's going to be successful. Think about when you go rent a car and they just like type away for like 15 minutes without saying anything. They're using like a terminal based software that has changed its UI for like 25 years. Like this amount of inertia in enterprises in like the systems they deploy in application areas is just enormous and something would have to be like so much better for many enterprises to go through the pain of changing a UI or changing a system because of all the dependencies. And that's something like some founders are still missing when they're kind of like looking at how to apply AI to disrupt X category. Yeah, that actually uh, brings me to the last question of this uh, fascinating chat. So, Teddy, uh, what do you think are your predictions for 2024 uh, in, in the tech world? I think what we'll get in 2024 is sort of more of the same. I'm I'm kind of more on the soft landing camp. That I think we'll just have a gradual recovery in tech markets. I don't think we'll see anything dramatic to the upside, but I'm also expecting and hopeful that we won't see anything big to the downside. So what it, what it means is that we'll see slowly growing software spend. Things will continue to be somewhat hard, but kind of constructive. Um, I think that kind of financing and investing is going to be very fundamentals driven. So companies will have to show good balance of growth and profitability, but investments will, will happen and rounds will happen. So I, I think it's kind of like more the same in, in, in a way that is slightly geared to the positive. That's my expectation. Lani? Yeah, I agree with those. And just on the AI thread, I would say, I think the major focus, at least at the beginning part of the year, is going to be around incorporating a lot of these technologies into existing software products and and packaged software, right? So like, there's a huge number of large software vendors who haven't released their Gen AI offering yet. Um, but when they do, you know, some of those things will be really interesting, right? And you know, people will maybe stop building their sort of jury rigged solution to that issue and start using it and realize that the combination of existing powerful software, data assets, and these capabilities will be quite impressive. Like most people still haven't even gotten access to the Microsoft Office Copilot capabilities yet. They still write their own PowerPoint presentations. So that I think will be a big activity next year. I think we may start to see some early traction around things like new form factors for AI devices. I don't know what those will be, right? Are they glasses or earbuds or you wear on your lapel or some, you know, thing that gets attached to your phone or something we haven't thought of yet. But I think you start to see a little bit of the ghost in that machine if you play around with the chat GPT voice conversation where, you you know, you'll talk to it and it talks back to you and you talk to it and it talks back to you and you can brainstorm with voice. Um, even though in some ways it's just a user interface tweak, um, it, it feels really different when you're using it. And related to that, I think around the, de the devices, I think there's a lot of new applications that are coming online with the more native multimodal functionality, the ability of the systems to understand images and um, and then incorporate that into all of the knowledge that it has already and produce responses that include both text and also images and potentially eventually video. I was having an issue with the electric blinds in my apartment and uh, like took a picture of the device that stuck on the wall and like brainstormed with ChatGPT to like solve the problem. And the first couple of approaches didn't work. And then eventually it wrestled it to the ground. And it was just like an amazing way to, to solve a problem, you know, where you can just sort of talk to it. And then I think we're going to see some of the industries that have previously been very res resistant to softwareification. Um, you know, software, I think over the last 
fairly long period of time has been an unusual part of the economy because if you compare it to other segments that people have traditionally thought of as large, like banking or telecommunications, which have tended to have just a few really big companies, the software market creates more billion dollar winners than pretty much any other industry. But one of the ways that it does that is by sort of taking over parts of other industries like you saw with Netflix and entertainment or Amazon and retail, you know, but they're really companies that have software DNA at their core. But there have been some industries that have been pretty resistant, like healthcare and education and law and things like that. And I think, you know, these new capabilities um, open up those frontiers a bit more. Really what you need is reliability to improve. And, you know, there's a lot of legal issues that people are struggling with, but also just at some point, you hit this tipping point where the system becomes better than the people, right? It gets, it's when, it, when you get to better than human performance at some task, it's no longer a minor efficiency improvement anymore. At that point, it's like, you know, a phase change, like ice turning to water um, and everything changes, right? Like, you know, it doesn't make sense to do it the way you were doing it before, right? And people start to reorient around it. And they start to see some ex example use cases there in 2024. And then it wouldn't surprise me if we see some motion, even though this is much harder, around advanced robotics. You, know, you see early versions of this with Boston Dynamics and what Tesla's doing uh, with their humanoid robot and uh, some, some things like that. But it's still you know, pretty rudimentary compared to the uh, amount of uh, progress that's being made on the language front. But we may see some more progress there. And then some really interesting things around uh, the combination of AI technologies and things like drug discovery and bio bioinformatics and pharma, you know, where it can, it seems to be, you know, the combination of these models and really sophisticated search and kind of more like AlphaGo or AlphaZero style reinforcement learning can start to basically leverage the capabilities to do brainstorming and then searches and, you know, attempts at creating answers. And it, it can actually mimic, you know, some aspects of the scientific discovery process and, you know, maybe come up with sort of truly novel things. Um, and, you know, and, and, and bioinformatics and drug discovery seem like one of those frontiers. That's fascinating. Thank you, gentlemen, Teddy, Lonnie. Uh, thanks for your continued support. Thanks for your time uh, today. Uh, I'm sure the listeners would find it fascinating. And hopefully 2024 is slightly better than 2023. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I al always said that it's been at the bottom for about six to nine months uh, of the year. And hopefully um, this bottom, you know, there is an upward trend next year. And um, cheers to that. So thank you all very much. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Raj. This was Into the Singleverse with Raj Verma. If you want to learn how to unleash the immense power of data, go to singlestore.com. Into the Singleverse is a production of Forbes Books. 